morning brothers and sisters Naomi back for another video um, I'm not a hundred percent sure where we're gonna go on this video uh, but we're gonna start out with that term that we looked at on the last video uh, which was the enthroned one and uh, we found that in reference to Cyrus in Isaiah 45 but um, it didn't make sense to me in the sense that you would call Cyrus the enthroned one uh, especially in the context of those chapters uh, that we've been looking at uh, Isaiah 40 from 40 to 45 really um, you look at those chapters and the servant that uh, God is clearly speaking about there is the daughter Zion that's that's the message you're going to come away with and so when it came to Cyrus's name we realized that it meant the enthroned one well this is what we were looking at or what I've been looking at and that is in Isaiah 52 verse 2 daughter Zion is called the enthroned one that is what she's called and um, you're gonna find that in Isaiah 52 verse 2 and um, and it's in a word uh, that you actually have to go and you have to know what they mean by these words and we said that Cyrus in Greek meant the enthroned one okay so it doesn't mean it in Hebrew I guess uh, it just takes you back to the meaning of whatever uh, I don't think it says enthroned one when you pull Cyrus's name up I can't remember what I come up with but anyway uh, so Isaiah 52 says Zion will escape and this is one of the passages that we referenced in, when you're going to find out who the strong right arm of God is, and that's daughter Zion. So you're going to have to look at Isaiah 51, Isaiah 52, and you're going to have to look at Psalm 89. And when you begin to understand what you're really looking at there, you begin to understand that you are looking at daughter Zion. But in Isaiah 52, it says this, verse 1 and 2 we'll read, Awake, awake, put on thy strength. O Zion. Now they want to take daughter out. That's okay because that's what these men who translate the words like to do to daughter. They like to remove her and mother as often as they can from the positive aspects. So, O daughter Zion, put on thy beautiful garments. O mother Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now we looked at uncir we look at we looked at circumcision and how it pertained to Abraham uh, in the covenant with the Lord and he agreed to circumcise not only himself but every man child in his household and we came to realize that that symbolized that the men of the household would not lust after the horror spirit in fact in, in, in effect not make a covenant with the horror spirit that was gonna exalt men as gods on the earth well now we found that that he did actually violate that covenant to a degree when he went out and got Hagar and we talked about that but here it makes it clear those uncircumcised who wants the whore spirit uh, they will not enter in here they will not be permitted um, so it says um, henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean now verse 2 this is where you're gonna get the enthroned one okay shake thyself from the dust this is also going to take us back to another verse we're going to look at in Isaiah 29 verse 4 but we'll read this for now um, shake thyself from the dust arise and sit down that word sit down means enthroned to be enthroned to be in a position of power she's sitting on a throne Shake thyself from the dust, arise, sit down, O Mother Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. Take off the bondage that this law has put you under. Fallen man's theology has put the daughters under bondage. Put it under them. We're under them. That's bondage. Mother says, I am not a God of various weights, and yet you teach, I teach various weights. I do not. And uh, take the bands from off thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And we get these instructions throughout. Remove the yoke from off your neck. Stand up. Take your place where you belong. All right? 
on the throne, sitting next to mother and son. And you see that in Psalm 110. We see those three numbers there in 110. Our 3068, that's Mother Yahweh's number, or Mother Jerusalem's number. You see Christ's number who sits to her right hand, which is 113. And then you see Daughter Zion's number that is sitting to Christ's right hand, and her number is 136. All right? And it says, to her, to that Lord, belongs the escape from death. All right? That's the spirit of Christ. Now, um, let's look at Isaiah 29 and see what we're going to pick up out of that to go with this. And we looked at this verse quite a while ago in another video. So it's 29 verse 4. Watch what it says. And thou shalt be brought down and shall speak out of the ground. And thy speech shall be low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as the one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. So that's taking us back to what we just read, really, in Isaiah 52, verse 2. She says, pick yourself up out of the dust. That's what she's telling us daughters of Zion to do. And she's beginning to see that happen, what it looks like in Isaiah 29. She begins to see... And hear that familiar voice of her daughters of Zion going, Who are we? <laughs> Show us who we are. Show us how to defend ourselves through the word, using the words. And she's looking for this core group of daughters to do that exact thing. And so she's saying here, Awake, awake, put on thy strength. And uh, we looked at how the spirit of these daughters comes from Mother Jerusalem, which is your mother from above, represented by Sarah, in Galatians 4.24. The, and we'll look at the Mosaic Law. Because that is the law that the Antichrist is absolutely going to put in play. And we know that as fact. Because the Bible tells us that. And if you go. And we'll show it to you briefly. We'll go to Galatians 4.24. I'll get there. Yeah, I'm too far in. Galatians, Ephesians. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> talking to myself. Okay, there it is. Okay, so it's Galatians 4, 24. Um, okay, let's backtrack and we will read 23. We'll start at 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That's Hagar. Her son Ishmael was born after the flesh, and that symbolizes lust. And it was lust on Abraham's part when he went out and got himself, supposedly, uh, another slave woman uh, for Sarah. And uh, we discussed what the law was for women pertaining to women at that time. He could have easily got rid of Sarah because she had failed to deliver a male heir to him, though he'd been promised one by God through Sarah. Um, and But he lost it. That's what this is saying, the flesh. The flesh lusts. And that's what his flesh did, though he agreed to be circumcised in the flesh, which meant that he wouldn't lust after the whore spirit. So here we have, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Now why ain't this working like it should? It keeps starting and stopping. Stop it. Okay. Um... But he of the free woman was born by the promise. Now watch what it says. 24. Which things are an allegory. You're to understand these in allegorical terms. For these are the two covenants. So what two covenants? Well, you have a covenant with the Holy Spirit. You have a covenant with the righteous spirit. And one's going to put you under bondage and one's going to free you. It tells you this. And that's what the women represents. The spirits. All right? He lost it. After Hagar, that's what he did. And Sarah said, fine, go into her. Because she knew she could possibly keep her place in the household by raising the son of another woman. And she says, fine, let God judge between me and thee. God knows what was in my heart and God knows what was in yours. And God chose her side. So by choosing her side, I take it that she was absolutely right in what she had concluded. 
Abraham had lusted after another woman and in doing so he brought on a whole other group of people that would come against Sarah's seed Israel um, so which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants the one from Mount Sinai where was Moses when he got the law and we're going to take a sharper look at what actually went down there because most are seriously confused on what took place there the one from Mount Sinai which gendereth bondage it puts you under bondage so it's not the Ten Commandments that Christ upheld because these put you under bondage what put you under bondage Old Testament law now let's finish reading this which gendereth to bondage which is Hagar for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia the mountain mountains represent your rulers this is representing your horror spirit which puts you under bondage and answer it to Jerusalem which is now in bondage with her children so what's ruling in Jerusalem right now it's telling us <laughs> the spirit of Babylon daughter Babylon which is represented by Hagar here 26 but Jerusalem which is above which is represented by Sarah is free which is the mother of us all now those people who wants to say well that's the Ten Commandments no it's not because those ten, ten Commandments frees us it is the new covenant established all right and Christ shows you he sums those Ten Commandments the laws up in two and we've talked about that love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy mind with all thy soul and the second is love thy neighbor as thyself all right so he sums the law but Old Testament law is the covenant between the Holy Spirit fallen man that puts you and the children under bondage it's the Holy Spirit's teachings that man came to just love like honey on his tongue all right so we know we're looking at that mosaic law that's going to put you under bondage and how many is there there's 613 with they've been amended they have so much added to them they come under Judaic law they come under Mosaic law Old Testament law and they have just bled throughout the world all right and many are confused because they believe they actually came from God well what did God tell the daughter Zion in Zechariah 11 she says break your covenant break your staff symbolizing that the spirit was actually saying okay this mantle is no longer mine they don't want me governing the body they no longer want me so she breaks her covenant symbolizing the spirit the righteous spirit that these men of Israel had rejected a covenant with and mother says you take that and you sell your mantle and she says what did you, do you think this mantle is worth and they said well we'll give you 30 pieces of silver and then mother says take those 30 pieces of silver and cast it to the potter's house because her intention is that she's going to reshape that mantle to be better and grand than what it was and we're told that in Isaiah 49 that she said you will now not only be a light unto the Israelites you will be a light unto the Gentiles and we speak how the daughters of Zion the righteous daughters of Zion were cast out in the fields of the Gentiles a land not inhabited and she comes to inhabit it all right and so she begins to claim in her birthright her mantle grows much larger what was Christ sold for 30 pieces of silver that's the symbol of her new mantle that's what that is coming into existence now so here we have proof that what's going to put you under bondage what the Antichrist is going to put in play which is already partially in play been in play is the mosaic laws that are done designed to subjugate women under men all right to put you under bondage and that's just what it says here Hagar and her children are under bondage she's the wife all right but when it's all said and done what does it say in Isaiah 54 let's go to Isaiah 54 Isaiah 54 says this 
It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Well, the married woman is Hagar, uh, the horror spirit Babylon, uh, which put you under bondage and fallen Adam came to exalt that horror spirit in his heart. Now, all right, we've looked at those passages. We're going to continue on now as we look, maybe, if my computer will work today, and it's not looking good. See, it didn't even come up. See, yeah, it's not even coming up, folks. There we go. Nope. doing that. Well, well, well. Okay. Let's keep trying. There we go. All right. So what are we going to look at first? Well, I wanted to draw a correlation briefly, if I can here. If it will stop working. All right. Fine. We'll go to the Bible. Maybe that's what the Lord wants me to do. Okay. Let's go to Jeremiah 51, all right? And uh, see if we can see a correlation here between these two verses that we find in Jeremiah 51 and in Revelations 8, okay? I'm just putting this out there for you, anybody who's looking into stuff like this. What does it say? I love this chapter because it's all about what's going to take place. Uh, it says, God's judgment upon Babylon, Jeremiah 51. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. Well, that destroying wind there, they give you the spirit again, like they tend to do in the Old Testament. But we come to understand it's, it's really uh, alluding to your empty doctrines. All right? Uh, two doctrines, in a sense. Um, so when we understood when, um, when uh, daughter Zion had uh, travailed and had been with child, but we have, as it were, brought forth when, you couldn't understand um, what you were looking at there until you actually looked up the Greek word for 17, and then you understood what she had brought forth. She had brought forth empty doctrine. And so she could not deliver the children. You can only deliver the children through truth. So here we have, in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind. So perhaps the destroying wind here is not empty doctrines, but really the opposite, the doctrines of truth that's going to bring them down out of the second heaven, that's going to destroy this horror spirit, daughter of Babylon, that man came to exalt in his heart, which basically raises him up as God in the earth. That's what it's designed to do. And to subjugate righteous daughters, and particularly at their feet, going, Oh, I have to bow down to you because you're my God. No, that's a lie. That's fallen theology taught by the horror spirit that he came to exalt in his heart. And then she says in Isaiah 47, she says, No one sees me <laughs> because he's hiding it. Verse 2. Um, okay, a destroying wind, and will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her, and shall empty her land, for in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. Three, against him that bendeth, let the archer bend her bow, his bow, and against her and him that lifteth herself up in his brigadine, and spare ye not her young men, destroying ye utterly all her host. So, uh, Babylon, if we understand, she mounted herself up to the heights of heaven. She's what's in the midst of the body. This very chapter tells us that. Um, and she says, I'm going to bring you down. So we're looking at the hosts of heaven being brought down. And she's actually likened to a fig tree. Because if we understand what the midst of the body here on earth is represented by, it's represented by Mount Zion in Israel. So she has been actually exalted on Mount Zion, Mount Jerusalem in Israel, representing the second heaven, which is where she mounted herself up. All right? Uh, let's look at this. Um, 
I love this chapter. I'd like to read the whole chapter, but I don't think I really have the time to do it. But I do want to read you verse 25, all right? Because we talked about how the mother spirit is going to actually level the playing field. Uh, and she says that in Zechariah 4. She says, oh, Matt, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to level the playing field. That's what she says she's going to do. And she's, then she's going to bring forth her own headstone. That's these daughters of Zion, the 144,000. We looked at that. But here in Jeremiah 51, 25, it says this. Behold, I am against the O oh, destroying mountain. There we go with the mountain again. Well, the destroying mountain that we are looking at, when you get looking at Jeremiah 51, is likened to Babylon, which has been exalted in the midst of the body, <clears throat> man's heart, the horror spirit, is what it represents. But it also represents the he goats, okay? Which came to be exalted as your mountains, your rulers in this earth, and they are not. It, they, actually, your rulers are called she goats in the Abrahamic Sarah covenant in Genesis 15:9. She's also your Azazel goat that was cast out in the land not inhabited, the Gentile nations. She's also the little flock of she goats that the Shulamite is shepherding in Song of Songs. All right. And um, we come to know them as daughters of Zion when you read all of Song of Songs. And um, there's other passages that speaks of goats. They talk about taking 12 goats, one for each tribe. Well, singular there, they got it 12 males. It's really 12 females. It's not 12 males. Your, your leaders, your rulers, your chiefs, your first fruits are always going to be female. Um, you'll get allusions to that all through the scriptures if you want to study the truth. Uh, Proverbs, wisdom is called the principle. She's the principle, which means she governs and she teaches the truth to the body. That's what she does. And she is not just a trait. She's an actual being, all right? Uh, and I will render unto Babylon, okay? So in 24, it says this, And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion, in your sight, saith the Lord. Verse 25, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyest all the earth. So their doctrine is poison. It's actually killing us. It's not bringing life to us. Okay? So this wind that's destroying Babylon out of the second heaven is the truth that daughter Zion has finally brought forth and is manifesting in the earth to deliver the children, uh, the body, which he is supposed to do. You see her doing that in Revelations 12 at the three and a half year mark, I believe. Um, which destroys all the earth, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and I will make thee a burnt mountain. So she's saying to Zion, who has mounted herself up to the heavens, it says that right in this very chapter, uh, she says, you who have mounted thyself up to the heavens. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, see if we can find it. Here in the midst of Babylon. Okay. Speaks of her dwelling upon many waters. So maybe it's chapter 50 that it actually says she does that. But it's in one of these chapters of Jeremiah that it speaks of Babylon mounting up to the heavens, to the heights of the heavens. So it's talking about her exalting herself into the midst of the body, which then exalts her into the second heaven, which is the midst. Now, they'll say she was cast down. Yeah, she was cast down. Yeah, she was exalted into the midst of uh, man, man's body, where he came to exalt in his heart, which was the horror spirit, wherein uh, you see that covenant of uh, Old Testament law, which is going to put Hagar and her children under bondage. But it is the truth, the truthful spirit manifesting in this earth that is going to free us from bondage. So here we have to speak, we have to rise up out of the dust, we have to take the yoke off our neck. That's what we have to do. Um, but uh, uh, linked to this verse, because I can't find where she says, she, uh, Mother says, you who have mounted yourself. 
up to the heavens. And by doing that, that puts her in charge of the earth. All right. Um, but what we find in correlation that parallels to Jeremiah 51, 25, to that mountain, that I'll make thee a burnt mountain. And 26, she says, and they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for a foundation, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Now, this is where I speak. She says, there'll be no branch took, there'll be no stone took. She's talking about a daughter. Because your daughter is your spirit okay that is going to rule the body and that's in B Joseph's blessings Joseph is where the stone the spirit comes from that's feminine that's the northern um, kingdom uh, which is these ten tribes all right and you see it in Joseph's blessings in Genesis 49 it says um, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches, daughters, run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved her and shot at her and hated her. And they did. They hated the righteous spirit. Uh, but her bow abode in strength, and the arms of her hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of, it says Jacob, it's Israel. From thence is the shepherdess, the stone of Israel. That's your spirit that you're founded upon. That's the bones of the body that makes it stand. That's what you come to exalt in your heart. All right? And so she warns daughter Babylon, there'll be no stone took from you. There'll be no branch took from you. There'll be no daughter taken from you. You think I'm going to choose a daughter out of you who corrupted my words? She says, it'll only come from my daughters who never corrupted my word. And that appears to be a long lineage of daughters who are actually physically linked to Israel, who were cast out into the land not inhabited, which is the Gentile nations. Um, so they are called the remnant of Israel, from my understanding. Uh, and um, it's, it's the daughters, it's the woman's lineage where you claim your heritage through Israel. It was never the sons. Um, so anyway, we're looking at that. But this verse here, the burnout man actually correlates to Revelations 8.8. 8. All right. So let's see what it says there. So Revelations 8.8 8 says this. It says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood right now why do they single out a great mountain burning with fire why because here we have Babylon alluded to as a mountain burning being cast into um, not the sea it doesn't say the sea but um, and I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. So the rocks is your heights, right? It's a picture of your heights. And in this case, not only the physical heights of Israel, where daughter Babylon, the whore spirit, came to be exalted in the heart of man, but then that exalts her into the midst of the second heaven. Now we see a correlation to that in the book of Daniel whether we realize that that's what we're looking at or not that's exactly what we're looking at so let's look at Daniel let's see if I can find it the chapter that we wanted was let me see here I actually wasn't gonna do all of this information I was gonna do um, the key of David but that's coming so where is it just a second. I, I think it's not there. Okay. So it's up here. I'll find it, folks. You're just a second. Give me a second here. Um, okay. It's not. Okay. So I'm coming up on it. Okay. So it's in chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, we actually get an allusion uh, to the host being cast down. 
But in this case, it was the righteous daughter Zion's representation that was actually cast down. Um, so you go read Daniel 8, and you understand uh, who exalted themselves where, and for w to what intent, and how. And all my videos, we explore this. But it says... Okay, so verse 8, verse 10. And this one stuck with me because I could not understand how a human male, one person, a, a wicked king, could cause the hosts of heaven in the second heaven to be cast down. But this is actually what we're looking at. Because when fallen Adam began to exalt that horror spirit here on earth, he gave her power in the heavens over the body. That's what he did. Um, and so it caused the righteous spirit daughter Zion represented as the Azazel goat that was cast into a land not inhabited. So you're looking at uh, a, many, a, a stacking here that you have to look at it in allegorical terms, which isn't easy always. Uh, but she actually got cast down into a land not inhabited again, represented by earth to a certain degree, a wilderness, a desert land. <laughs> Can you imagine being the host of heaven and looking at earth and the condition it's in? You'd be going, man, I don't want to go to that desert. I don't want to go to that dry land. Um, I don't want to go to that land not inhabited. Can you just imagine what it might look like to them? But this is what it says. Um, we'll start at verse 9. But you should go in and read the entire chapter to pick the entire context of it up. Uh, but we'll start at 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. What land? The pleasant land. Well, what's Israel called? The pleasant land. Verse 10. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Well, how is that possible? How is that possible? It's possible just exactly the way that we've been telling you it is. And verse 11, they've got he, it's she. Yea, she magnified herself even to the principle of the host, the great daughter Zion. Mother Jerusalem's representation here on earth. That horror spirit, that harlot spirit, magnified herself to the principle of the host. And she became the principle that established this body, the horror spirit. That fallen Adam has found it. His false theology upon which exalts him as a God in the earth. This is what you're looking at. And she magnified herself even to the principle of the host. And by her, the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of her sanctuary was cast down. That's daughter Zion being cast down. You know where else you get an allusion to that? In Lamentations chapter 1 and 2. And you've got to understand, because you've got to come up against that negativity about, oh, well, she's to blame for it all. <laughs> she brought it on. You better look at it in the correct terminology, because was Christ to blame for it all? No. But he bore those sins. For what fallen Adam did, he bore those sins, right? Well, she, the righteous spirit, daughter Zion, is forced to do the same thing. She has to bear the sins for what that harlot spirit did which was to cause fallen Adam to exalt the harlot in his heart instead of the righteous spirit daughter Zion, which they completely outright reject as the ruler of the body. All right? So, 11, ye have magnified yourself even to the principle of the host, and by her the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of her sanctuary was cast down. That was the body. The, the heavenlies was hers. She dwelt in the midst of it, the, the holy of holies and but this uh fallen adam fell the heavens are falling they're dying verse 12 and an host was given to her against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression by reason of unfaithfulness and it cast down the truth are we getting this sorry i don't see anything it's all white all right, there, we're back. And what does it say? And she cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. So who's whispering out of the dust of the earth 
It's daughter Zion, the spirit of daughter Zion rising up going, hold on here, wait a second. Something ain't right to this theology. It sounds a bit like a lie to my ear. And um, so she does. She picks herself up out of the dust. She takes this yoke off of her neck that the horse spirit and fallen Adam have put on her neck to try to keep her locked in to keep him alive. <laughs> because he'll die without her. Plain and simple. Um, then I heard one saint speaking to another. Now, I'm not going to go into this because I'm still studying this, but I'm starting to understand that. I'm kind of understanding that. But you see how it's absolutely possible that the righteous spirit, she got cast down. Because man began to exalt the whore spirit in his heart. And that's what those two women represent in allegory. Two spirit, one a righteous spirit, one a harlot spirit. One puts you under bondage. That is Old Testament law, Mosaic law. It's not Noahidic law. It's Mosaic law law that's going to keep you under bondage and that's what it tells you and when Moses came down from the mountain the first time Mount Sinai where I believe he had received the Ten Commandments and then he saw what the children of Israel were doing they were bowing down to one of these false images that had leaked in from the Adamic nations that surrounded her they were bowing down and they were worshiping it as if it was God and Moses got mad and he cast them down. Well, when he cast and broke those two tablets, it was a symbol of the breaking of the original covenant. All right? Which is not your ten, which was your Ten Commandments is your original covenant, which then Christ come to, to remake with the Spirit, to put her back in her rightful place. That's what we're looking at. And so we see what really kind of went down on Mount Sinai again when we take into account what went down in Zechariah 11 when mother says fine to her daughter's on they don't want a covenant with you break your staff in symbology break the staff with your your inheritance which were the children of Israel she says break that one too then she says take it and sell your mantle to the high priest ask him what it's worth your services was worth as the spirit that governed the body, the nation of Israel. And they said, it's worth 30 pieces of silver. And she thought, well, that's a good price. And mother then says to her, go cast it to the potter's house because I'm going to remake it. I'm going to reshape it for you. And I'm going to give it back to you. That's what she says. And so that's what you're looking at. And um, so... But then when we look at the correlation to what went with uh, Mount Sinai, the second time Moses went up, she says to her, okay, let's go look at it so we get it clearly. Zechariah 11, because this is exactly what took place on Mount Sinai. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll get that. Okay, Zechariah chapter 11. Okay, this is what she says. She says, okay, break your staff. Um, this is what she says. 16, for lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye or hers. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. But she says, give him the idle shepherd. That's what she says. She says, give him the idle shepherd that they want to be governed by. So she's saying here, let them have the horror spirit. They want the horror spirit to govern them. Let them have it. And I think she does the exact same thing on Mount Sinai. She says, fine, they want to be governed by that harlot spirit that they want to bow down and worship as a God, then they can have it. So she gives them that. And you see, they are under bondage, under the Mosaic law, according to Galatians 4.24. We are not under the Noahidic law. We're under Mosaic law, which keeps you under bondage. And that is the law that the Antichrist is going to put in play. Alright? 
So you can go, Noah hide, Noah hide, it's Mosaic law. But that's much more offensive to the Judaic men and women who are practicing it. So we don't dare say Mosaic law, but that's precisely what it is. But it's also going to appeal to the masses, the religious masses. It's going to appeal to Judaism. It's going to appeal to Christians, Old Testament law, because there's a lot of Christians that's actually still practicing Old Testament law and uh, been deceived into thinking that they're not, but they really are, because it actually bled over into the New Testament to a large extent. And um, the Islamists, well, they love it. It, it. You know, it'll do exactly what their laws is doing. It'll subjugate you. It'll put you under bondage, especially women. And it says the Antichrist has no respect of women. It doesn't mean he's gay. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you simply don't respect them as equals. Which means that your rights as a woman will be removed. Whatever rights that you have gained are going to be removed from you. Because he has absolutely no respect for women. He don't believe you're an equal. <laughs> Which is what Mosaic Law teaches. That's what it teaches. It teaches bondage. And it just told us that in Galatians 4.24. So we need to clear that up and get it right. Now, I was going to go into the key of David and how Daughters are, and it's absolutely the government of the world, the key uh, of David that will be placed upon Christ's shoulder, which is the government. Um, I was going to go in and show you all of that, how they manipulated it all, change the gender of the spirit, which is represented by your daughter Zion, made it all male, and your key of David, and all that, uh, which is in total opposition to your key of Solomon, which is the Holy Spirit, all right, which the occult world worships. Okay, so um, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm going to do another, pro I'll probably end up doing another two to three videos on the key of David because it's so comprehensive. There is so much information, but I figure it's just so much easier if I pull up all the passages and I begin to read through them uh, and try to pull out the understanding that I have come to understand. Uh, and it might help you if you're trying to understand this key of David as the daughters of Zion, because that's clearly what they are. Um, you know, again, I'll say again, uh, David left the gates in the wall open, okay? It's called a breach in the wall. And he left it open knowing full well that it was the daughters of Zion, which was took, to, I believe it was 12,000, took from every tribe of Israel. And uh, they had houses inside of Judah uh, because um, their birthright was on Mount Zion. And their, their um, purpose was to make laws that governed the body. And these laws were righteous laws, laws of equity. They were not suppressing laws. They suppressed nobody. All right? Everybody was equal under these laws. And, uh, but that's what they were, this key of David. That's why it's called the key of David. Because he left these gates opened. And uh, when Solomon took power and began to marry uh, wives from all these surrounding nations, um, he uh, tore down the hot houses, it says, on these walls. And in Jeremiah 9, we see the daughters of Zion called your cunning women, your wise women, which is another word for princesses, by the way, um, which is what Sarah's name uh, is going to take you back to mean, princess. Actually, it's your principal, your first fruits. Uh, and um, Jeremiah is told to summon these cunning women so that they might weep for themselves weep for what was being done to the righteous spirit in her position that they were removing through violence through wicked laws that men had put themselves in charge of after marrying these horse spirits but solomon is seen daubing these this breach up as it's called and tearing these houses down and building a palace an extension uh, for his horror wives that he took from the surrounding nations and putting them in charge of the doctrine of the body which then actually puts him in charge and he comes to exalt not only the Ashtoreth poles but Moloch. Moloch means great king. So he was looking to exalt himself as a great king in the earth <clears throat> is what he was really doing. And so you have this total opposition, the key of David the righteous spirit, which is placed now upon Christ's shoulder, which is the government of the world, the way that the world is ruled by God. 
and versus um, the key of Solomon, which is the whore spirit, all right? Which is what we, as the daughters of Zion, have to take down through truth, all right? That's what we have to do. Okay, so I think that's where we're going to leave it at. Hopefully, I'll get another video uh, on the key of David fairly soon. Um, thanks for anybody who's watching my videos. Hi, Nick. Uh, hope you enjoy the video. Love ya. Love your encouragement. Uh, and um, I thank all my brothers and sisters out there who's watching my videos, who's taking the time to try to actually understand um, what the Spirit has shown me. I appreciate you taking the time, sharing it, liking, subscribing, and all that. I thank you for that. Um, and um, I hope the Lord blesses you in uh, all your um, endeavors uh, that you're pursuing to understand uh, through the Spirit. Um, and um, I hope you all have um, a really nice day.